Could you tell us a little bit about the road to this book? And then we'll talk about the road from the book to the movie. Yeah, the book was long in the making. Uh, you know, Marty Sherwin, who alas is no longer with us, he he died in October 2021, just two weeks after we learned that Nolan was making the, the film. Uh, but Marty signed a contract with Knopf in 1980 to tackle a biography of Robert Oppenheimer. And he worked on it, you know, off and on. He was a tenured professor at his, of history at Tufts. He worked on it for 20 years. And uh, then he came to me in 1999 and uh, suggested that maybe we should collaborate and I should join him on his Oppenheimer journey. And actually, I, I declined. I turned him down. <laughs> Uh, just because, you know, I, I I told him that I liked him too much to become his collaborator. And I, what I meant was I feared, you know, collaboration is fraught with perils, big egos that biographers have. <laughs> uh, it's hard to write a book. It's hard, hard to write a book with two people. And um, but he kept coming back to me coming down from Boston and uh, sort of taking us out to dinner, my wife, Susan and I. And, uh, you know, at one point he, he was very funny. Marty had a great sense of humor and irony about himself. And he, he at one point he turned to me and he says, you know, if you don't join me on this project, my gravestone is gonna read, he took it with him. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I did join him and he told me when I did, oh, you know, I just want to warn you, there are very, there, there are still holes in the research. We haven't done enough research on the 1930s. We don't know what Oppenheimer was doing as a physicist at Berkeley. Well, none of this was true. There were really no holes <laughs> and as we started to write, uh, you know, Marty would call me up from Boston and very excited every few weeks and say, hey, I just found another box of archival documents in the attic <laughs> that he had forgotten about. <laughs> you know, he'd gotten biographer's disease. He had, he had, uh, you know, he just, he was obsessed with his subject and he knew there was always one more archive or one more interview that needed to be done before he could start to write. And that's a typical story that, that happens all the time with biography. Uh, anyway, I joined him and I started to write the childhood years and this prompted him to start writing. And as Katrina just said, you know, it, it turned into a, a fabulous collaboration and, and we were still friends at the end of the five years. When we when we published the book, you say biographer's disease. I know exactly what you mean. Um, uh, and the book came out, and it did tremendously well. Um, uh, won the Pulitzer Prize. But did you envision when it came out that it would someday be you know one of the biggest selling movies of all time? No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, you know, the book got great reviews on front pages of book reviews all over the country. And and even before the book won the Pulitzer Prize, uh, someone came along and bought a film option on yes. the book. But uh, the American Prometheus never got on a bestseller list. It sold modestly. Uh, you know, it was a, an expensive 720 page book to print, um, lots of photographs and, uh, but Knopf, you know, did a great pub printing, but, you know, no one had any expectation that this was going to sell tens of thousands of copies. And indeed it didn't. <laughs> So, <laughs> I, my, mem my memory is that you had a great editor at Knopf who s stayed with books, Angus Cameron. Well, I, yeah, yeah, Let's Angus see. was the editor who sa signed up Marty in the first instance okay. back in 1980. And he, uh, uh, 
Uh, he would regularly just extend Marty's contract and send him a new contract to sign. You don't see that today. <laughs> I wanted to ask then, you after my died. I know. Then, then I know. Angus died, and Marty got another editor, and she left Knopf. And <laughs> so he outlived his. <laughs> he, you know, we finally on the third editor, uh, Anne Close brought it across the finishing line, but. I wanted to ask you about the afterlife, another afterlife, not just the movie, but you and Marty decided you were going to work to rehabilitate uh, Oppenheimer and nullify the 1954 Atomic Energy Commission yep. kangaroo court decision. Yeah, no, uh, you know, the book came out in 2005 and uh, I think in 2006 or 2007, uh, we, Marty and I began to think, well, we wrote a memo about the uh, sort of trying to catalog all the egregious uh, errors and violations of their own procedures that the Atomic Energy Commission had made in the course of the security hearing in 1954. And uh, we went to a law firm in, in Washington, a high powered law firm and uh, persuaded them to take on the case pro bono to investigate whether Oppenheimer could be, you know, we could go through the courts and force the energy department to overturn the, con the conviction as such. And, uh, you know, Washington's a small town. So uh, this firm began doing the research. And about three months later, we get a phone call from one of the associates very sheepishly saying, well, I'm sorry, but uh, I have to report that we have to back out of this pro bono case now because one of our partners is objecting. And the partner in question was C. Boyden Gray, who had been White House counsel to President Bush, <laughs> first Bush and whose father was Gordon Gray, who was the chairman of the, the commission that convicted Oppenheimer. And he was outraged to learn that his own law firm was trying to overturn <laughs> the case and, and uh, you know, put a black mark on his own father. So they had to withdraw. Anyway, uh, Marty and I continued for years on this. It took a dozen years, but finally last December, the Energy Department indeed issued an executive order nullifying the 1954 decision. You said that somebody bought the film rights right away. I assume that wasn't Christopher Nolan. So, oh. so how did it get from an incredibly well-received, critically well-received book that not a million people bought to a plausible movie? What, what's that story? Well, it, it's an entirely an accident. <laughs> you, know, you know, the nature of life, <laughs> uh, and particularly in the case of the life of books. No, you know, several parties had the film option over many years. Marty and I were initially quite excited. Oh, Hollywood's knocking, you know. Uh, but they'd always talk a good game and nothing would ever happen. And uh, occasionally we would be shown scripts which were kind of lackluster. One was so terrible. There were, there were three scripts that were written before Nolan came along. One was so terrible, Marty and I had to sit down and write a memo listing the 108 factual historical wow. errors. <laughs> and so we, we killed that script. But, you know, the author has no control. If they wanted to go ahead and just, they bought the rights, they could do it. The only thing we could do would be to take our name off the off the movie. Anyway, Marty and I had given up by, you know, 2021. 20, uh, we thought this is never going to happen. It's too complicated a story. And then suddenly I get a phone call uh, saying that Christopher Nolan wants to talk to you. And indeed, we had a chat over the phone in September of 2021. And he explained that uh, the person who had the film option 
had bought the film option in 2015 was a guy named Dave Wargo, who had studied physics at MIT and had made a, a good fortune in uh, business over the years uh, and had a just a private obsession with the Oppenheimer story. And he loved the book and he held on to the film option. And uh, in the midst of the pandemic, he flew out, Dave Wargo flew out to California in a private jet uh, because he was afraid of the virus and uh, got the book into the hands of one of Nolan's producers. And that guy passed the book to Nolan in early 21. And Nolan read the book, apparently fell in love with it. And without contacting us and sort of on spec, he sat down in the late spring and summer of 21 and wrote a long screenplay of over 200 pages just to see if he could do it. And then he called us in September of 21 and said, I've picked up the option on the film. I've written a screenplay that is for a three hour film. Uh, it's entirely based on your book and uh, we're gonna do it. And we were stunned. I, you know, by that time, unfortunately, Marty had, he was so ill, he couldn't travel up to New York to meet with Nolan. So I did that by myself with my wife, Sue. And Nolan didn't was, explain that he was a great admirer of the book, but he wasn't going to share with us the script. He would answer our questions, and he did so over two and a half hours. So I was able to come back to Marty and report to him that I, I thought the that Nolan was very intelligent and that he was doing a, a, a film deeply based on the book. But then Marty died two weeks later. So, and just to end this story, it, it, that was in September and the film was announced in October. And then in February of 22, just before Nolan started to film, to go on set, uh, we had another meeting, and this time he shared with me the screenplay and uh, put me into a Greenwich Village hotel room and handed me the script and told me, you know, spend, take however many hours you need to read it. Uh, you know, it was stamped confidential all over. <laughs> it was, he's very, <laughs> uh, very private in his Scary. approach to the work. But I read the script, took me almost four hours. Uh, and I was blown away by it. it. It was, I could see it was brilliant. Um, that it was a lot of the dialogue was straight out of the book. Um, you know, it was hard for me. I'm not a no judge of screenplays, but, you know, it was hard for me to imagine the the screenplay on the film on on the screen but uh you know i thought it was a good script and i found two small suggestions to make to o nolan but what were they and he accepted both but uh i i told him that i noticed that at one point in the script he had uh oppenheimer answering a question from a uh, in the hear in the security hearing, well, how many people, Dr. Oppenheimer, died as a result of the gadget that you built? And his answer was 70,000 in the screenplay. And as I was telling this to Nolan, he says, yes, yes, I, I know, I, I understand that that's a low figure. You know, most historians use the figure that's double that, 140,000 for the two cities killed in the immediate you know, that day. Um, and I'm trying to find a way, he said, to fix that. But it's based on that. That was the transcript in the hearing. That's what Oppenheimer answered. So that was interesting. He, you know, he knew that, that there was a problem with that figure. And he did in the film. You can see he, he uh, 
has Oppenheimer himself using the 70,000 figure and then saying, well, no, it's 140,000. Well, maybe even more than that. <laughs> what was the other thing you caught? I'm sorry? So you caught two things. What was the yeah. other? Well, I also suggested that he make sure that he have, uh, a, that he somehow managed to insert the, the quote from Oppenheimer saying uh, that this was a weapon that we used on an essentially already defeated enemy. Yeah. And that comes from a speech that Oppenheimer gave three, just three months after Hiroshima. And indeed, it, it, you know, the in the film, the dialogue is very fast paced and it goes by in a second, but he has Oppenheimer saying this, those exact words to Edward Teller. Um, and that, that too is important to establish, uh, you know, some of the, the history and, and um, intelligence about what we knew about Jap how close the Japanese were to surrendering when the bomb was actually used. We have a lot of questions. Maybe we'll go for a few more minutes, Don, and then open um, Yeah, I, I just, um, one thing I wanted to ask you about was whether you were surprised by, a friend of mine put it this way, he said, it's astonishing that somebody managed to get a major studio to make a three hour movie about the blacklist. <laughs> I wondered, you know, um, how do you feel about that? There's a, you know, there's Oppenheimer's personal story, there's the story of the bomb, and then there's the, the framing of the film is the hearing. So in a sense, the film, you can, you know, you can, I can see where my friend saw it that way. Yeah, no, absolutely. It, it is an extraordinary uh, thing. And, you know, I remember when Marty and I were writing the narrative in 2002, 2003, at one point he, he turned to me, Marty did, and he said, you know, Kai, we wouldn't be the two of us working so hard over so many years, you know, Marty in, ended up spending 25 years on this book. Uh, we wouldn't be working so hard on this if the story was just about the making of the gadget, the atomic bomb, if it was just a story about uh, the father of the atomic bomb. What really makes the, the story interesting and gives it an arc is that he is uh, triumphant hailed as America's best known, most brilliant scientist in 1945. And then nine years later, tragically, he's brought down in this security hearing in 1954, and he becomes the chief celebrity victim of, of the entire McCarthy witch hunts. And it's really a story about McCarthyism and the seeds of that politics that we are still living with. And no one got that, because as you can see, uh, half the film is, is devoted to the trial and Louis Straws and his determination to, in the words of Edward Teller, defrock Oppenheimer in his own church and strip him of his ability as a scientist to speak as a public intellectual about politics and policy precisely because of his uh, communist, allegedly communist background and associations in the 30s and because of his opposition to the building of the hydrogen bomb. 